Uh, my name is Ben Summers. I work at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School at Brigham Women's Hospital. I'm a primary care doctor and a health economist, and I'm talking today about uh, the impact of the Affordable Care Act on health insurance coverage. You know, the, the biggest coverage expansions uh, took effect on January 1st of 2014, and this is the, the Medicaid expansions in the participating states, which is just over half, and then the new availability of tax credits for people buying private insurance through the, the federal or state marketplaces. And so this kicked in in January. Open enrollment for the marketplace coverage began in October and finished up at the end of March. So it's really only the last three months, April, you know, April, May, and June, that the, the policy has been in full effect. And, uh, and that's the data we focused on in assessing the long-term impact of this first year of open enrollment. Well, so what we did in this study was we used uh, national survey data and we focused on the, the 18 to 64 year old age group. Uh, uh, this is the, the, really the, the group most uh, impacted by these expansions because people 65 and over already have Medicare and uh, children, while there are some changes related to the ACA, for the most part already had a fairly wide availability of, of Medicaid and CHIP coverage in the lower income groups. So the biggest impact is going to be in that working age adult population. And so there, we, we found that compared to where the, the coverage trends were going prior to open enrollment, uh, in, in the past uh, three months of the, the second quarter of 2014, uh, we estimated that the uninsured rate had dropped by about five percentage points in this population, which corresponds to about 10 million more adults with insurance uh, than previously. Right, we wanted to then see how much the pattern of this uh, increase in insurance mapped onto what you might expect from the Affordable Care Act, because other things can affect insurance, of, uh, of course, including the economy and employment status. So we directly adjusted for those factors, uh, but then also looked at the pattern of coverage gains across different states and income groups. And what we found was that the, the gains were largest for low-income people in those states that are expanding Medicaid, whereas non-expanding states had no statistically significant change in coverage for their low-income adults. And then in the middle income group, those between 133 and 400% of poverty, uh, those who are uh, generally eligible for tax credits for private coverage, we found major gains in insurance in both expansion and non-expansion states, since these states uh, are all uh, eligible for subsidies, whereas the Medicaid uh, expansion is only happening in some of the states. You know, there, there is no perfect or, or true control group here because even in states that didn't expand, there are elements of the ACA that are going to affect even lower income people. So for instance, the application process for Medicaid has gotten streamlined. Um, people are now hearing more about coverage and there's the, the mandate for coverage. So we might very well see more people getting signed up even in those states, but uh, it's, it's very likely that we would see much bigger gains in those that are, that are expanding Medicaid and, and that's what we see in our data. It wasn't quite, so we, we looked at both whether a state was expanding Medicaid and then also looked at different income groups. So the Medicaid expansion decision really impacts those adults below 138% of the federal poverty level. This is the group targeted by the Medicaid expansion. And we found that there was a significant decline in the uninsured rate for low-income adults in, in the expansion states. But when you look in the non-expansion states, poorer adults didn't have a statistically significant change. Meanwhile, in that middle income group, 138 to 400% of poverty, where they're eligible for tax credits regardless of what the state's doing with Medicaid, we found major gains in coverage for all states. So in this middle income range, uh, there are a couple factors. So one is that the, the marketplaces now make it easier for people to consider what different insurance they might be eligible for. The insurance companies are also now no longer able to uh, exclude people for pre-existing conditions, which is a big change. But then probably most importantly is that if you're in this income group, the federal government gives you a tax subsidy. They give you a tax credit to buy private coverage, and, and that happens in all states. It doesn't depend on the Medicaid expansion. So, so we would expect, and, and in fact we see, that the uninsured rate has gone down in this middle income group in all states. The, the individual insurance market for a long time has been fairly dysfunctional for a lot of people. So if you had a pre-existing condition, you often couldn't get coverage at all or it was way too expensive. Um, it was often hard to know exactly what you were getting, what, what coverage benefits were included in a plan versus another plan. Um, and there was the, the lengthy medical underwriting process in most cases where you had to have your medical chart evaluated, you had to have uh, some blood drawn and a physical exam. 
All of that is gone now under the regulations of the ACA. So what you're left with is a much more straightforward process. People go online, they look at the marketplace, they compare their plans, and then decide whether or not they want to buy it. So, so we do, in fact, see some small gains, even for people whose incomes are too high for our subsidies. And this is probably because they are uh, you know, better able to consider their options and they don't have to worry about pre-existing conditions. So uh, we, we do see that change as well, even, even in the, the people who don't get subsidies. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard for us to comment exactly in this data set of, of whether individual people are better or worse off because we only see each person once in the survey. So we see people in 2012, 2013, 2014, but they're not the same people. So there are un undoubtedly some people who, who have been adversely affected by this law. People who had pr uh, policies that they liked, they thought the premiums were affordable, and now because of different regulations uh, as part of the ACA, they either couldn't continue that plan or they had to pay more for it if they weren't qualifying for a subsidy. So there are definitely people in that boat. But what our data show is that at the population level, uh, there are far more winners than losers so far. If we look at net coverage, you know, we're seeing 10 million more net coverage. So if, if some people have lost coverage, that's been more than outweighed by you know, the, the, the people gaining insurance. And similarly, in our, in our study, we looked at two outcomes related to access to care. So we, uh, we looked at whether people had a personal doctor, um, and we found a, a, a major increase. About 4 million more adults said, yes, I now have a personal doctor than, than before. And we looked at whether people said they could afford their medical care. And uh, we saw a major change there with about 5 million fewer adults saying, I, I have problems affording care. I can't get what I need. So while there are definitely always going to be some, some winners and losers in any complicated policy like this, at the population level, at the national level, our findings are suggesting that, that uh, coverage and access have, have significantly improved on net based on, on the first open enrollment period. You know, it, it, that's it's a big unanswered question. Um, you know, the pattern over the past couple of years has been this uh, sharp uh, decrease in the rate of growth of healthcare costs, and there are a lot of factors that may be playing a role. Uh, the ACA and some of its payment reforms, in particular in Medicare, may be a part of that. Um, on the other hand, uh, some recent data has shown that this, there's a similar pattern going on in other developed countries, in Europe, for instance. So it's not entirely clear how much of this is the ACA versus the economy or other just large changes in, in health care that, that may be separate from the law. Um, you know, one, I think one misperception is that the Massachusetts law was, uh, was a cost driver. Massachusetts has always been fairly expensive when you look at its health care compared to other states. After Massachusetts health reform, which covered you know, nearly everyone in the state, Massachusetts continued to have one of the most expensive healthcare systems in the country, but it actually didn't accelerate in any particular way. It, it looked like it, it kind of kept on its prior growth curve. So, you know, there's certainly some budget pressures because more of the spending was being subsidized by the state. But in general, I think the, the ACA, if it ends up following suit with Massachusetts, will show that the coverage expansions, while costly are not going to bust the budget. What's going to really determine our health care budget going forward is, is what we do with medical spending on people who already had coverage, in particular with people with chronic illness, the elderly uh, who are much more expensive than younger adults. And, and if we can get our, our hands wrapped around how to control the kind of growth and costs related to medical technology, uh, that's probably going to be even more important than the coverage expansions from the ACA.